It's the Resistance Report for November 27th, 2017, where we try to connect the dots and give you context for what's happening. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, hope you enjoyed yourself, or at least got a little bit away from this nightmare that we are all in, called the Trump administration and these Republican Congress people who want to give a kind of reverse Robin Hood. They want to take from the, the poor and the middle class and give to the rich. This week, the biggest thing that is happening, or likely to happen, is a Senate vote on the Senate version of this Trump Republican tax plan. Now, you remember that House Republicans recently voted in their version of tax overhaul. I love, I love it how they call, they call it tax reform, as if this really is a reform or overhaul. I mean, this is a major change. It's a regressive change backwards. If Senate Republicans succeed this week, the two measures are going to go to a conference committee to iron out differences between the two bills, and they'll be voted on again. But the big action is this week, because if this abomination of a tax plan, and, and it is, I use that word advisedly, it is an abomination. If this is going to be stopped, it's going to be stopped by three courageous Republican senators who've looked at the facts and who's going to be hurt and who's going to be helped by this, and they have determined that they cannot in good conscience vote for it. Now, here's the, you know, one of the most interesting things about these tax plans emerging from the House and the Senate of Republicans, and I've seen a lot of plans. I've seen a lot of tax plans. I was there uh, around Washington when there was the Reagan plan and then the Bush plan, George W. Bush plan. Uh, they all had different economists, different experts, different groups making different predictions. What's really interesting this time, what's new, is how much unanimity there is among experts, policy analysts, and economists about the consequences of the tax plans that are emerging right now from the House and the Senate. Almost everyone who's had looked at these two bills has determined that the biggest winners, who are going to be the biggest winners? The winners are going to be the rich who already in America have more money than the rich have ever had, who are doing better than they have ever done. And that the taxes of some middle class Americans are going to go up. And that everybody else also is going to be hurt because they won't be able to, first of all, afford health insurance. The Senate bill, I just want to remind you, removes the mandate in the Affordable Care Act for healthier and younger people to buy insurance, thereby raising the premiums of most other people who are less healthy or older. And that generates about $300 billion in savings that the Republicans in the Senate are going to be using to give away tax cuts. Uh, also, Medicaid and Medicare will almost surely have to be cut in order to pay for this giant tax cut. And also, interest rates on loans that people take out for buying an automobile or washing machine or a home. You might want to buy a home. All of those interest rates are likely to rise because the national debt is going to go up and will crowd out private savings and investment. Now, what's the evidence? Even Congress's own Joint Committee on Taxation. Now, I want to stress with you, this is Congress's own committee. The head of it is report appointed by the Republicans. They are the House and Senate's official scorekeeper on tax issues. They find that the Senate's version of the bill will increase taxes on all income groups making under $75,000 year. By 2027, and this is important, by 2027, it would give its biggest tax breaks to those making $1 billion or more. The millionaire class are going to do great. Everybody else is not. The House bill would be even more generous to millionaires and billionaires. 
The Joint Committee on Taxation reports that even apart from the loss of health benefits, by 2027, people earning less than $75,000 would end up paying more taxes. Why is that? It's because individual tax cuts expire in 2026. And corporate tax cuts are permanent. The biggest beneficiaries are obviously shareholders of big corporations. And the richest 1% of Americans owns 40% of all the shares of stock in America. The top 10% own 80% of all the shares of stock in America. So if shares of stock go up, and they've been going up in anticipation, in anticipation of this big cut in taxes for corporations, then obviously the rich do even better. Now, the other thing that is very important here is that the Republican plan also explodes the federal deficit. There is no doubt about it. Even the conservative tax foundation this foundation is a major proponent of the corporate tax cuts. It estimates that the House bill is going to cause a $1.08 trillion revenue loss over 10 years, and the Senate bill a $516 billion loss. Now, this is the most conservative group you can get of analysts. The Joint Committee on Taxation that I referred to a moment ago, they say these bills will increase deficits by $1.4 trillion. In the University of Chicago survey, they just did a survey of economists, 88% of economists agree that the federal debt is going to be substantially higher as a share of the economy by 2027 if these bills go into effect. Now, one other thing I want to mention to you, because it hasn't really got the attention it deserves. And it needs to have attention. There are all kinds of things in these bills. You know, these are big, fat bills. But you need to look at this other thing. The House version of the tax bill also repeals something called the Johnson Amendment. This is, the Johnson Amendment actually uh, was put in place in 1954 by Lyndon Johnson when he was Senator Lyndon Johnson. That Johnson Amendment bars churches and other charities from using tax-deductible contributions for political purposes. It seems logical, doesn't it? The current Senate version of the tax bill does not repeal the Johnson Amendment, but that could change because the House version does repeal it. Now, here's why this is so important, because right now, super PACs, super PACs, you know, they're just big, basically, ways of getting money, big money, into politics. So you have super PACs may raise unlimited campaign money, but right now, at least they have to disclose their sources. Now also right now, you have so-called social welfare nonprofits they can also raise limitless contributions, and they don't have to disclose their sources. But here's the catch. That money is not tax deductible. Now, repeal of the Johnson Amendment would allow sham charities, anybody could set up a, a charity or anybody could set up a church, sham churches, to rake in unlimited and undisclosed contributions for campaigns that were also tax deductible, where you didn't have to disclose your sources. Presto, corporations and wealthy individuals could secretly take over our democracy and deduct the takeover costs from their taxes. Yet Republican leaders and the Trump White House continue, they continue to lie. They lie about all of this. That's all we get from all of them, lies. They continue to lie about the consequences of the tax cut. One of the most dangerous aspects of this awful period in American life is the denigration of the truth 
out of institutions and people who tell the truth. In my experience, there are two kinds of liars. There are fools and knaves. Fools lie because they don't know the truth. Knaves lie because they intend to mislead. So here's your fools. There are a lot of fools in Washington, and here are your knaves. And the knaves intend to mislead, and the fools don't know they're not telling the truth. Now, Trump is is both a knave and a fool because, let's face it, he doesn't even care enough about the truth to find out what the truth is. He'll say whatever he thinks will get people to believe what he wants them to believe. But what about people like Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, uh, who's Trump's point person on the Republican tax bills? Mnuchin intrigues me because I've known a lot of Treasury Secretaries and the Treasury Secretary, the, 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 the role of the Treasury Secretary, it starts with Alexander Hamilton. Uh, I mean, it's a very prestigious role, and it's a public, it's vested with public power. So you would expect and need Treasury Secretaries to really be honest with the public about the taxes and, and other aspects of the public fisc. Mnuchin continues to insist that the legislation these tax bills puts a higher burden on people earning more than a million dollars a year and reduces taxes on everybody else. Uh, Mnuchin said just uh, a couple of days ago, he said, quote, I can tell you that virtually everybody in the middle class is going to get a tax cut and will get a significant tax cut. Repeatedly, repeatedly, he says this. So, what's going on? Is Mnuchin a fool? I mean, his career before he became Treasury Secretary doesn't suggest he's a fool. He graduated from Yale. Not that many fools graduate from Yale. Well, now that I think about it. Well, he worked for 17 years for investment bank Gold, uh, Goldman Sachs. Not too many fools. Well, I take that back. But let's assume, for the sake of the argument, that Mnuchin is not a fool. If not, He's lying through his teeth about all this. He must be a knave. He intends to deceive the public. By doing so, he has abandoned his duty to the American people, inherent in the oath of office taken by every cabinet official, in favor of advancing the goals of his boss and other Republicans in Washington who are desperate to pass their tax bill. He's also sacrificed his credibility and integrity. Why? Because he's Secretary of the Treasury in an administration that has no integrity. Merely by joining up with Trump, he made a Faustian bargain, and he lost whatever integrity he might have had. Mnuchin will say anything to retain his power and influence in the Trump administration. He knows he'll never have anything close to this power again. He probably figures, so what if he lies about the true consequences of these tax bills? Trump lies about them. So does the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. So does Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. He probably assumes most of the public will never know he lied. And even those who know will soon forget. In this era of Trump, Trumpian big lies, in... There are no consequences for lying. Everybody does it. Now, remember, the House has already voted. So it's now in the Senate's lap, this whole tax thing. Senate Democrats are not going to vote for this tax bill, but Republicans occupy 52 seats in the Senate. So we're going to have to rely on three Republican senators to derail this, as I said, abomination. Who might these three senators be? Well, one could be 
Senator Bob Corker from Tennessee, who has vowed to oppose tax cuts if he believes they increase the debt after accounting for growth. Now, there are two other senators, Senators James Lankford of Kentucky Uh, and also Jerry Moran of Kansas, uh, they are also concerned about the debt. So it's possible that you could get Corker or Lankford or Moran or all three of them, possibly, if they really are genuinely concerned about the debt and this thing explodes the debt, they might vote against it. There's also Senator Jeff Flake of Arizona. Now, Flake has already sounded out against the Trump administration. Uh, and his concern is that it's really not tax reform. He doesn't just want tax cuts for the sake of tax cuts. There's also Senator Susan Collins from Maine. She has openly worried that families will be paying higher premiums and that more than cancel out whatever tax cut they might get. Now also remember that Corker and Flake and one other senator I haven't mentioned that's John McCain of Arizona. They're retiring from the Senate. So the question is whether among this group of six senators, there are three who have the integrity to stop this locomotive. Now, I can't tell you what's going to happen, but since its founding, this nation has depended on honest people in Washington trying to do the right thing. This week is going to be a test. Now, if you haven't contacted your senators yet, please do. Please tell them you oppose tax cuts for the rich and tax increases for everybody else. Here's the number uh, for the Senate switchboard. All right? 202-224-3121. That's 202-224-3121. Call your senators. Tell them you oppose this, these tax cuts, these are not tax reforms, they're not overhauls, they are just redistributions from the middle class and the poor to the rich and big corporations. And let me just say this, if you want to learn more about how we got to this point, into this mess where corporations and the rich dominate our politics, I humbly encourage you to watch our new documentary directed by Jake Kornbluth called Saving Capitalism which is now available on Netflix. It's there. You, if you have a Netflix membership, you could watch it tonight. And now, for your questions. Okay, Rene Fope. Uh, if the tax bill is passed, but Democrats take control in 2018, can the bill be reversed? Well, Rene, if Democrats take control of the House, they don't have control of the Senate, you need new legislation to reverse this tax bill, so that's not going to be enough. But suppose Democrats take control of the House and the Senate, they still couldn't reverse this tax bill because if Trump is still there in 2019 and 2020, uh, then he could veto any new bill to replace this tax abomination. So we also have to make sure Trump is not there. Now, to, uh, I, I just should say, I don't want to, I don't want to discourage you, all right? I mean, we can overcome this and we will overcome this and with a different Congress and we will have eventually a different Congress and we will eventually have a different president. 
The Marsha Scully, Marsha Rocky Scully, how and why does the Trump family get away with half the stuff they do, stuff that's unethical, immov immoral, even unlawful? If you or I did it, I, I thought our government had checks and balances, but now I think it either doesn't have them or doesn't apply them equally. Well, Marsha, this goes back to what I was suggesting before. Our government, our democratic government, small d, does depend on responsible people. I mean, if you want to, if you have power, if you are president of the United States, or if you are a senator or representative on the take, you're actually taking money from the wealthy or big corporations in order to boost your political power. You know, there's not much we can do about it. We depend on ethics. We depend on people who care about the process, who care about democracy. And so, yes, there's an ethics committee, there's, there's ethics offices, there are things that can be done, and eventually maybe there's going to be an impeachment. And some of this will come up in a Trump impeachment. But for now, there's nothing that can be done without your effort, without your ongoing, mobilizing, energizing, organizing at the grassroots. Sandy Collins. The Supreme Court and other judicial agencies are currently being stacked to lean right in favor of mega corporations, not family issues like organic food, clean water, good air. Is there anything we can do? Well, Sandy, this again, the reason they're being stacked is because politics is stacked. And the reason politics is stacked is because the majority of us don't have the voice we need in a democracy, which goes directly back to what we have to do in 2018, and that is get our voices and as loud and clear as we possibly can. You know, I often think about the public right now that I meet all over the country as a kind of spring coil. I mean, people are so infuriated by what is happening in our government, in our politics, they are ready to spring forth and take our government and our democracy back. And I think, hopefully, you're part of that, and that will happen. And hopefully, and starting in 2018, Bill Rogers, last question. What specifically can we do to end the influence of corporations and billionaires on our political system? Bill, there are a lot of things that can be done if we have the political power and resolve to do it. I mean, for one thing, full disclosure of every dollar that is put into our campaign system in terms of who we are, it comes from, what co corporation, what individual. Uh, secondly, public financing of campaigns. And some states are doing this. And public financing, you know, you can do both that I just mentioned, that is full disclosure and public financing, notwithstanding the Citizens United case and decision by the Supreme Court. We want to reverse that decision too because we want campaign finance control. We want to limit the amount of dollars pouring into our political system. And then also we want to slow the revolving door between business and government, which is now revolving faster than ever before. And we want to get rid of gerrymandering, gerrymandering, and, and have district reform. A lot of things need to happen, and they will happen. And I, I, I guess I want to end on this note, because kind of a post-Thanksgiving note, I think it's important to end on, an uplifting note. Every time in our nation's history, where we have, as a nation, faced a fundamental challenge in terms of the future of our democratic, political, and even capital systems, capitalistic system, we have met that challenge, eventually. We did it in the 1880s, 1890s, with regard to the robber barons and the Gilded Age. We did it in the 1930s, when we had a Great Depression, and the entire system, our political and economic system, looked like it was going down the drain. Other countries succumbed to fascism and communism. We did not. We rebuilt. We reformed. And we again in the 1960s with regard to African Americans and women and 
elderly. Look at Medicare and Medicaid. We can and we will do it again. That's our challenge. I want to thank the people who made tonight possible. Desire, Masha Yade, Andrew Santana, and the great director, the great talented Jacob Kornbluth, here, right in my office, right now. Can you imagine that? See you next week. <laughs>